Welcome to Pods with Posh and Paul, a podcast designed to inspire and challenge listeners through story, experience and insight. To face adversity, learn from suffering and discover how to embrace life with a heart filled with love and gratitude. We are so thrilled to have you journey with us and can't wait to share your stories. Join Sue O'Callaghan and Joanne Webb as we disrupt the theory that everyone has perfect lives. At times, life-changing events happen to us, and the pain and trauma are so scary that we bury it deep within us. But what are the consequences of this? Can we mask the pain and indeed be who we are here to be? Claire Williamson, now in her 30s, pregnant with her third child, is the picture of health, radiant and glowing. You wouldn't know that 14 years ago she was raped while travelling around South America after being drugged. Upon returning home, Claire planned to seek help, tell her parents and receive counselling. Instead, she clammed up, didn't want to upset anyone, and stayed quiet. Claire didn't face her pain. Rather, she decided to play it safe. She threw herself into life, climbed the career ladder, and lived a life that wasn't truly in line with who she was. When we bury things deep, they tend to manifest themselves in various ways, and Claire felt powerless. After hitting rock bottom, Claire had a light bulb moment and decided things needed to change, and thus began her journey of healing and regaining her power back. Today, Claire is an inspirational coach who offers her clients clarity, structure and guidance with rave reviews. Claire believes we can all heal and that we don't have to live with the pain of a life-altering ordeal like rape for five years, ten years or even a year. That we have the choice to take our power back immediately or not. It all starts with feeling the fire of intention, making the decision to create change. Then to be forgiving of yourself and create the vision of who you want to become. Here to tell her story and share her wisdom, we are so pleased to welcome Claire Williamson. Hi Claire, how are you? Hey, how are you? I'm good, thank you. You're looking radiant and beautiful. Welcome to the show and thank you so much for coming on. Claire, you have a very hard-hitting story, which is quite shocking to all of us. You were innocently travelling in your early 20s over in South America, having a rip-roaring time. Is that right? Yep, yep. You had the time of your life for a year and your trip's coming to an end. You are at a kind of a party kind of thing and you're with people who you thought you could trust, but apparently not. And you went through a really hideous ordeal. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I um, I remember it. I remember it clearly because it was a it was a celebration. It was like a big cultural celebration. And so it had been going on all day long. We'd been celebrating and we had had quite a few drinks during the day and I I remember making this conscious decision to just stop drinking and to just drink water and had a meal and so I was really clear-headed and then I woke up the next morning and I, could, I couldn't remember anything mm-hmm. I was I was laying next to somebody I didn't know I had pain physical pain I felt like I felt like I drank more than I'd ever drank in my life, you know, and none of the pieces fit together and and I just felt really anxious and scared. Um, And I really didn't know what to do with that. I was still around these people that I kind of knew, kind of didn't know. So I just kind of went into this survival mode, just one foot in front of the other. And I pretty much carried on in that way for the next 14 years of my life it was like it was like my life stopped that day it was like and obviously as time went on immediately in the next few days memories started to come back and I was really I really was clear what had happened but I didn't have all the pieces of how it had happened and those flashbacks continued to come over the next sort of 12 months um but because this was the end of my trip because I'd been away for a year in my head. I was like, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my parents, I'm going to get some help. I could see how it was affecting me. I was, I started to become really recluse. I didn't really do anything with those last three months of the trip. I just, you know, yeah, again, just got through. So I had this, this intention to get some help. And I remember getting off the plane and my parents were so happy to see me that I just, I just couldn't tell them. And it was like I swallowed it down and it didn't come up. Like it didn't come up at all. 
I, I shared with my, my best friend at university and she tried to help me, but I just threw myself into drinking, into, you know, the study and leaving university just made this decision. Like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go after what's safe. And so Claire, um, for our listeners, you s- describe not being able to put the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together, but you describe waking up with somebody lying next to you in bed in physical pain. And you've told us that you discovered you were drug rape. Is that correct? Yeah, because I realized that there was no way that I could have been drunk. Like that was the first thing I knew. And I battled with that because you, f- you, you it's like you feel guilty. You feel like you've done something wrong. You know, maybe I forgot that I just decided to get hammered, but you don't. (laughs) Like, you know, it's like you've got this logic and this just shame banging against each other all of the time. You go back to your teenage years where your parents told you to watch what you drink and watch where you go. and, And like, it's almost like it's just this battle of inner knowing what's happened but all this, it's wrapped up in all this shame that you, you, it must have been me. It must have been something I've done. And we will have so many listeners on here. The stats are really high for rape. I think it's one in six American women have either been through an attempted or successful rape. And it's one in 33 men. So we're not just isolating this to women. Men are raped as well. So the stats are really high. So we'll have many listeners that are affected by what you're saying right now. And I think one of the critical elements you've talked about is the shame that you feel. And nobody's been through the situation before, obviously. There's not a strategy for coming through it. So you talk about not wanting to talk about it. You talk about the shame. But how did you actually deal with it? How did you face that internally in your psyche yourself? By creating safety. Like, that. that's what I did for such a long time. It's like I pushed it down and I, I guess I'm a very visual person and it was almost like I put it in a box and locked down the lid and then that box was shoved right into the back of my mind but obviously it was driving every single decision every single action it I I began to suffer with this chronic anxiety that was I I couldn't get away from that it was it was just debilitating and yet it was like I'd lost my voice you know people would say well what's happened that's so bad that you can be in this in this state and it was like I just couldn't I couldn't say it and like I say I shared with my best friend at university and I shared with my husband but that was about it (laughs) it was like when when I met my husband obviously and so it's like this silence you take on this silence and you feel like you you don't have a place to share it and after so much time gone past why would you share it what's going to change if you share it and so you said you ran to safety, which is, I know you only a small amount, Claire, and I can see how vivacious and gregarious you are. And I don't think you're a safe person necessarily. I think you like to take chances and you like to stretch the limits. And obviously by going out traveling on your own in South America, that proves that kind of person you are. So what did run into safety look like to you? How did that manifest? So I pretty much finished university and I went into a safe job and I met a really safe man who was actually my husband. <laughs> um, and I just became less of myself. I didn't chase big goals. But the thing is, I think that I'm kind of inherently wired to chase those big goals. And so what would happen is they would land in my lap. Like, it, I think, you know, I'd been home two years from the trip and I found myself in this job where I was getting pushed up the ladder and when I got to the top, like I fell off, like I had, I had a full on breakdown because I just couldn't cope with the idea that it was so sort of so much pressure and I felt so exposed and I was obviously battling with everything internally. And I call that breakdown now, like my breakthrough, right? Cause it was where I hit, I truly hit rock bottom. We hear from guests all the time and both Sue and I have obviously lived through certain traumas. It's almost like we're being a fraud through life because we're not living true to ourselves. We're trying to live a certain way because that's the way the pathway shoved us. And we kind of get lost along the way. And that's where the word fraud comes up all the time. It's a common theme. Is that Would that resonate with you? It does, yeah. And, you know, like when I had that breakthrough, <laughs> breakdown, <laughs> actually was right before it, right before I had that breakdown, I'd sort of got to that place of realisation that 
something was really wrong. Like I wasn't on the right path and I couldn't see what the path was. And I actually went back to South America. I took a sabbatical from work and I went to Brazil instead of the other places that I've been to. So it's like, like a new part. And I volunteered in a rainforest project. So I spent a month literally just sat in the trees, <laughs> you know, working in the nursery. I was supporting them with their marketing. And it was really then that I saw it clear, right? It was like, I actually remember being in this massive rainstorm and this rain's just pounding down. And I'm looking at this rain and I'm going like, where have you gone? Like, this is you. This is you here right now doing something out of your comfort zone, doing something to create an impact. Where, where has she gone? And again, I went home with that intention. I'm going to change stuff. I'm going to have a voice. I'm going to find out what it is I really want to do. But instead, I went the opposite way because it was just too confronting. I went back into my, my job that I'd come from and that big, you know, mountain to climb over of finding myself, it was just too big. And I, I just, yeah, I fell completely off. That's when I truly hit rock bottom and I think that's really important for listeners because Joe and I talk a lot about there's different levels of awareness in terms of our suffering because um, our immediate reaction sometimes is to shut it down to avoid it to run away from it and then when we're aware of it we can go through various levels of healing and healing doesn't happen instantly healing is a lifetime journey isn't it there's different layers and before we came on the podcast we were chatting and you said the rate led to a decline of your mental health you were left powerless and I think powerless is a big word in terms of trauma for women or men listening to this and also you said it was a defining point in your life in terms of it manifesting as anxiety so there's so many different layers of healing to go on and so I think for listeners who are on board now who feel as though they haven't gone on their journey of healing we'd say to you there's different layers and the first layer is acceptance isn't it coming to terms with it but it sounds like you've been on an incredible journey over what 14 years it's been now hasn't it but it still affects you today do you know, it, it doesn't affect me today. I'm, I'm so proud to say, like, so in 2017, I, I, had another, I had another dip. I think it was, the, it was that point where it was like, okay, I have to get on top of this. I'm a parent. I'm living a life that I don't recognise. I don't recognise myself. We're broke. My husband's miserable. I don't even, I'm so anxious I can't take the kids to the playgroup. I have panic attacks in supermarkets. My eldest, I think she was about three, and my youngest was obviously just a baby. And I just I just realised, we actually ended up in a food bank, actually. That was what happened. Like, we exhausted every single credit card. I wasn't working. I was an entrepreneur. I'd started my own business, but I wasn't working in my business. I'd trained as a life coach, but I wasn't, I just wasn't able to go out there and and do anything with it, go all in. And so in this food bank, it was right there. I was like, everything has to change. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know how, but it was like an internal decision. It was like taking that awareness and saying, do you know what? There's more for me. There's more for my children. We're all worth more. I'm going to change something. And that intention was so deep, like it just rocked me. And it was like from that point, the universe opened doors I was like, I stepped out of the food bank and within a week I was presented with this network marketing opportunity, which was great. But what was better was the lady who I connected with, who was a, was a, a spiritual coach. And I began this journey of healing because I think we don't know what healing looks like, right? We don't know what, where, where it starts, what the elements are. Like, are we going and having counseling, therapy? And for me, it was none of that. It was a journey of it was, it was coming full circle, actually, to what you said. Like, Claire, you don't seem like the sort of person who would hold back, play small. Well, that was who I used to be. And then there was that period in the middle where I just crumbled and hid away back to that person that I always was. And so that journey started in 2017. And I actually started writing a book about the experiences and – what I discovered was that it was a form of emotional biohacking because you're going back into those memories and you're seeing them from a whole new perspective that creates these whole different outcomes in your life, right? And that was a real deep healing for me. And I really came to terms with the fact that that rape was not my fault. 
and I came to terms with a whole lot of other stuff as well but what really came to the surface was that the the feeling that I'd the the meaning that I believed I walked out of that rape with so in our in our trauma we we define a meaning right that you know we're overwhelmed emotionally and we lay that meaning down and it just gets ground into our sub, subconscious and I believed that it was the rape that made me feel so powerless but through the journey of writing the book I saw how that that belief had been laid down in my childhood growing up with my mum who actually has bipolar and and that was the real healing like it was almost as if like I I'd kind of healed the rape but to fully heal the rape had to heal everything underneath it as well and I'm actually still on that journey I'm still on that journey of healing right now because there's so much of it to do right and I think we'll be we'll be growing until the day we die anyway but it's like that was that was a real enlightenment for me and it's something that I notice a lot now that these traumas that we have in later life they're actually a confirmation of something we're already subconsciously believing about ourselves yeah, yeah. and it's not so easy to understand what those experiences were that created those meanings because often those beliefs are laid down before we've, we've even got that cognition right you Absolutely. know the, those those formative years between zero and seven we walk around only in 30 percent of our conscious behavior you know everything we do is only 30 percent of the time conscious everything else is in our subconscious and you're right you've gone deep within your subconscious to look at those beliefs that are there to change and that's part of the healing journey that Sue and I talk about all the time we can look at ourselves as people and go I don't like that 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 and that and I'm going to change it but actually until you go deep within your subconscious they don't really properly change or the change doesn't stay you yeah. easily get drawn back into them subconscious beliefs so it's only when you go really deep down to the core of the onion that we can yeah. really find but and it, are you right it's a lifelong journey and each level of healing brings up new surprises, doesn't it? And like yeah. sometimes you can go, right, I'm really kicking life right now. This is great. And the next minute you're on the floor again, you go, bloody hell, I thought I'd healed from that. But when you come to that level of acceptance, you can face it head on. You can look it in the eye and you go, I'm going to deal with this now because I know I, I'm brave. I know I've got the courage to do it and I'm going to be vulnerable and I'm going to look it in the eye and I'm going to do it. Yeah. And you neutralize, I mean, I'm, I specifically started working with, it's called the E4 trauma method because it works to neutralize the feeling around the trauma. So that feeling of power, powerlessness, like you actually go into the memories where that was laid down and you neutralize the feeling of it in the memory. So you're working in the subconscious with the subconscious you set a new declaration. And then in the present, it's like you almost say, Oh, hello there you are, instead of, oh my God, I'm stuck, like I'm going into those subconscious train wrecks of thought from one little feeling that just kicks everything else off. And it can be days, weeks before you notice, So oh, hang on a minute, like what, what's happened? Yeah. I'm feeling really low. I've not worked on my business. I've not worked in my business. Mm -hmm. My relationship's got to, to, to mm -hmm. screw. So it's sort of like, it's, it is all about consciousness and taking that awareness of something to the ability to use tools in the moment to actually do something, you know, positive, productive and um, connect with an, a new belief. So obviously our beliefs only became a belief in the first place because we thought something so many times. And so the new belief has to be the same. We set habits, just like physical biohacking. We can't do it once or twice. It has to be every day. Yeah. And so with the emotional biohacking, it's like creating that new belief system and then affirming it every single day and utilizing that affirmation in those moments where you're triggered by the feeling that you're now consciousness, um, conscious of. Because for me, I noticed it was trapped and stuck. I'd suddenly feel trapped and stuck and I felt it. We obviously met at her story and I felt it right in the weeks leading up to that. I didn't write my speech until like literally days before. Yeah. It was like somebody had pushed me into this corner and that feeling was reflecting that feeling of powerlessness, which was causing me to just like give, you know, step out, tap out, yeah. do nothing, freeze. And it wasn't until, it was funny, it took me a while to go, oh, there it is, there it is, that feeling again. And as soon as I had, 
I sort of I started moving again. Claire, if we bring come back to our listeners and we come back to talking about healing, I'm fascinated by the healing because you talk about the E4 trauma method and obviously there's transaction analysis, there's cognitive behaviour therapy, there's EMDR, there's all sorts of different healing therapies and Joe and I are very much about there's no set routine method strategy for healing. If it's grief, if it's trauma, pain, adversity, conflict, there's no set formula that one can go through to follow. So for listeners that are saying, well, I just don't know where to start. We also talk about it being very holistic. Part of our therapy is talking to girlfriends. It's talking to maybe a mother that you're close close to, or an aunt. It's actually being out. It's having a healthy form of exercise, healthy diet. It's having therapy when that is due so for trauma PTSD there's a role for therapy but other forms of therapy are mindfulness meditation and it's the holistic approach of bringing everything into our lives it's finding self-love you talk about getting rid of shame and loving yourself again and knowing that you weren't responsible for it so in terms of holistic healing for our listeners it it takes many different angles doesn't it to get to that path and that journey that place where you you actually said it doesn't affect you today and I know many of our listeners will be thinking I want to get to that place where the rape doesn't affect me today it's taking the emotion away one of the things I learned writing that book is that when you I think it's a Joe Dispenza quote as well like once you take the emotion away from your experiences you're left with wisdom and it's there that you can then help other people with I believe we go through everything on purpose you know I don't believe there's any coincidences in it and as I guess horrible as it might sound it's like did I have to go through that experience to be able to come to the realization that there was so much in my childhood that I needed to heal that I couldn't fight anymore like I like I said to you I sort of left home I think I was around about 15 16 and I went into this place of, I am going to prove to the world that I am not powerless, that we can always, you know, so it wasn't a positive way to be. It was like, it was like fighting to prove something rather than believing that it was true, right? And then going through the rape, it was like, okay, well, actually, it isn't true, so I'm just going to give up mm-hmm. <laughs> and just believe, sit in that belief that I am powerless, so what, what's the point? One of my steps back to myself was starting kickboxing. So I actually became a, a Muay Thai fighter. But again, it was fighting. It was fighting it's sort of like not a, posi- not a positive way to recover, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. What we have to be is in this place of acceptance. And like I often say, if, if you talk about something, it still brings the tears you haven't healed. But that's so hard as well, isn't it? Because you say you talk about taking the emotion out of what's the event, what's going on. But actually, if it's a recent event... You can't take the emotion out of it. Raw is raw, dark is dark, bleak is bleak, hard is hard, and you cannot take the emotion out. But we go to those props, we go to the fridge, we go to alcohol, we go to busy ourselves at work or with friendships to avoid the emotion. But then we've got to come back and actually deal with the emotion in order for the emotion Mm -hmm. to go. Yeah, but what if we learn to start doing that in every single moment? Like the, the power is now, right? And if you can go on that journey of really understanding yourself and really trusting in the process of life and in those moments where something is really hard, it's like, okay, what am I meant to learn here? Mm. Like I lost a friend a few, it was right in the middle of COVID-19 and she'd been battling breast cancer for, we'd known each other 30 years and it was like, it absolutely in the moment just I was heartbroken but on a positive like it was almost like it's a switch now to say okay well what have I really got to learn here and it was like it was really strange it was like I realized that I felt like we have an entitlement to life and that we have an entitlement to go 80 years in our life and then we die and that it was unfair that she died and actually, it was it was really strange. It was like I realized that I actually had a lot of fear around death. I had a lot of misunderstanding around death. And I hadn't perhaps appreciated myself, her, other people in my life. You know, like it's almost like that reminder that we, we don't, nothing's guaranteed. No day is guaranteed. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like taking the expectations back to appreciation in every single moment, appreciating what something is for what it is. And the reason why these emotions get like so suppressed is because we do push them down and we do try to avoid them. We don't try and feel them in the moment. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be hurt. It's okay to be angry. 
it's okay to feel guilty, but how do we how do we process those emotions? And we've processed, I think we've processed them through that understanding, like taking it from a challenge, something negative, to something positive, an opportunity to learn. Yeah. And it always just takes practice as well, doesn't it? You know, like the three of us have obviously been on a healing journey and we all admit hands in the air we're still on that healing journey and um, but you're right we face things as like you know so you've had heartbreak recently I've had heartbreak recently but we're not on the floor we're not overeating we're not going to vices we felt the feelings there and then we felt them and we address them like you say and we find the lessons we find the moments of gratitude we you know it just makes you rethink your life a little bit with each with each heartbreak or with each trauma or adversity that life throws at you and we can all be victims or we can be empowered can't we as you say and it's a choice it's we choose how we react to life and it's interesting you talk about your emotions as you deal with your emotions you come into wisdom and your journey obviously over 12 14 years has been to come to this incredible place of healing what would you say to listeners who are on board but they have recently been raped because we're not saying to those people to avoid the emotions or to come into a place of finding purpose in it. There is no purpose for rape. You were wrongly raped. You didn't deserve it. And those emotions for listeners will be right now anger and fear and and hatred and rage and sadness and loss and grief, all those emotions. And they're real. So we're not saying to listeners to avoid them or to come to a place of wisdom from it, because when you're in it, you're in it. What would you actually say to those people who have been raped in the last month? that are in that place that is really raw and they can't see hope? I would say to to believe with every ounce of your being that it's not your fault and to forgive yourself for anything that you're blaming yourself for in the moment that, and to know that that feeling of shame is actually really normal and that I think... Like one of the things that I did was two or three days after I was raped, I walked up to the police station and it was a big building and I just stood there in front of it. And I think now, like, what if I'd have just walked through the doors? What if I'd have just, you know, said something to somebody on the other side? Like, what if, like, that, we we have a voice for a reason. And I think the longer we go without saying what has happened, the more likely it is it's going to push down and it's not it's not going to come out, right? And the damage is not the experience itself. It's how we torture ourselves every single day about the experience. And um, what happens when you open your mouth and you start to talk to somebody is instead of these imagined scenarios, your imagined fault, you know, it's like you actually get somebody else's perspective. So I rang just just very recently actually the right the rape crisis line here in Tauranga and I spoke to them and I made sure that I got their details and I put them on my website to say like to anybody just reach out there are crisis lines they do know what to say they're trained and that little bit of new perspective on your pain can completely change how you then go forward with that pain, the decisions that you make, like whether you do decide to go to therapy, whether you do decide to tell the police, none of that's possible for me now because I made a decision in the moment to shut my mouth and not say a word. And that's quite and common, run, isn't I it, can... Claire? That is quite common. We know that most cases of rape go unnotified. Um, People don't go to the police. Why is it? And would you recommend that victims do go to the police? Because we're doing it from a place of feeling like we're in the wrong, right? It's like you fear that you won't be believed and yeah. and there's evidence for that as well, obviously. But do you know why people keep getting away with these things? Is because not enough people stand up yeah. and I- say what is going on, like what the truth is. And the more voices that start to speak, then the, the, that baseline, that precedent starts to change. Yeah. There's an amazing guy who helped with my anxiety, not personally, but I read his stuff. Stephen Porges, who does, he's like a, a stress response scientist. I don't know what he is, but he helped me to understand the nervous system. And when you're in that place of fight or flight, if that's not working for you, your body shuts down. 
So drug or no drug, the likelihood is I would have laid there and played dead because it was safer than trying to fight back. And we don't understand how our bodies work in that way. But the more these cases come out, the more it lays down this precedent of your body has a physical, biological response that you can't overcome. You can't fight through that experience because your body, your, your brain is telling you that it's safer to just play dead and not move and you're physically immobilized, right? So it's like, I think we have to start speaking out. And I also, I was on Instagram maybe six months ago now and it, I just, for some reason, it was The Guardian, I think. And it was a video and it was from Chile. And I clicked into it. It was all these women. And I could see that they had signs about speaking, using their voice. And it was all in Spanish. And I clicked into the video and it was like a thousand women in this square in Chile, in, in Santiago. And they were doing their, this uh, rap. And it was like this repeated over and over again. It is not our fault. We did not ask for that. This is not culturally right. And they were repeating it over and over and over again. And it suddenly, it was like somebody had just kicked me in the solar plexus. I lost my breath. I felt like I was going to vomit. I realized that I was not alone. Mm -hmm. What I'd been through in that country, thousands and thousands of women go through that every single day because there is a cultural acceptance. There is this machismo with the men, you know, and the, and the whole dictatorship background as well and and the power in them speaking out it just it just hit me like a, a train I realized like so it's just so many people keeping quiet it's not the way and what had happened was that that rap had gone all the way around the world so women had come together in Europe in London in America and they'd done the same thing I think it's really and important that, that women do get that message that it's not their fault oh or men sorry I don't mean to men, just be yeah. specific because I think you're right, we're so good at blaming ourselves for the smallest of things to the biggest of things. And I think there is such a stigma around, right, you know, often it happens when there has been drink involved or drugs involved. It doesn't matter. Your body is your body. It's sacred. It's all yours. And it's never OK for somebody to do that. It's never OK. And it's never your fault. Regardless of the situation, it has to be consensual for it to be OK. And I think you've hit the nail on the head also because we want to acknowledge the men that are listening that have been raped because the stats yeah. in America are huge. 17.7 .7 million Americans. American women have been victims of rape and 2.78 million men have also been victims of rape so if you are listening and you're a man we would encourage you also to speak out we've got some great podcasts haven't we Kenneth Clearwater who speaks on um, male victims of rape and sexual assault please do feel as that you can speak out don't think because you're a man and it's it's a, a women's um, crime that you can't speak out do seek help do go to the police and do report it as well absolutely and and out of that you can question like I think one of the questions was for me like where where did I get that where did I get that belief that I was I was so fundamentally flawed that it could be my fault why didn't I walk out that experience going that was not my fault why didn't I have that confidence already that belief and that was what caused me to to really question going back and trying to and as a coach, I think the, the biggest limiting belief I come across in general is that there's something wrong with me. I'm not good enough. I'm not capable enough. I'm inadequate. So where, where does that come from? And how, how, like as a mother, I just, you know, it's like thinking of your children and how they might be developing those beliefs. Like what are we doing to create those beliefs and how do we resolve that? So that we're creating those resilient adults and confident adults and, because it's such a common theme for a lot of us. We, I think most people have an element of that within them. It's no. interesting because it comes back to our thoughts again, doesn't it? What are our thoughts? I, If I hadn't have been at that party, if I hadn't have had that drink, if I hadn't have said yes at that moment, if I hadn't have accepted that invitation, I would be in this situation right now. So how do we change those thoughts around? And that's another podcast in itself, isn't it? That's another discussion. But we need to change those thought patterns. It was okay that I went to that party. I accepted that invitation in good faith. And it's changing the thoughts that we have about ourselves and our beliefs to come into a place of loving ourselves and accepting rather than doubting or coming into a place of shame. I yeah. think a lot of things come back to, to self-love at the end of the day and you know whether that's not feeling worthy, not feeling enough, feeling inadequate, all of the things that you've just explained you know Louise Hay was amazing at self-love, she just threw self-love at us for all the years she was alive 
And I think it's the core of everything. And as you say, as a mother, we just want to instill that into our children, don't we? And if we can truly, truly love ourselves, flaws and all, That's then right. unconditional those self-love. absolute unconditional love for ourselves, the way we unconditionally love our children or our parents or our friends, whatever that love looks like to you, if we can all love ourselves, imagine the vibrations of the universe and imagine yeah. we wouldn't have all those internal awful dialogues that we have about you know I'm an awful person or I'm nasty or I shouldn't be doing that I'm not worthy of that balls to all of that we're all absolutely beautiful as humans and we deserve our own love and Claire we can see you've come to that place you radiate such beauty now you're an inspiration to our listeners your story is remarkable your recovery journey is inspirational in itself if there's one I, message I do I was going to say, I do want to say, like, it's so hard in these sorts of interviews because you're like, and I did this and I did this and it was all great. But you know what? This has been this has been a really hard journey. And if I could give any sort of, I guess, learnings, it's that, number one, make that decision. Like, just get that intention that I got in that food bank. Don't let it be, you, you know, complete bankruptcy to get you to that place of I'm going to do something about this but feel that fire of intention find that intention make that decision because that is the start yeah and be forgiving with yourself tap into resources believe that there is a process for me that process started with vision so if I'm in this place of like how the hell have I got to this place like where do I actually want to be it was confronting because in that moment I couldn't see anything. I could just see black. I'd lived in that survival mode for so long that any sort of alternative just seemed like complete, in, completely impossible. So what did I have to do to start creating the vision of the, of the person I really wanted to become? And who could I follow? Who could I tap into? Like Louise Hay, listening to podcasts, listening to YouTube channels, reading books, the journey has a start, but it doesn't necessarily have a straight line after that. <laughs> it's a journey and you learn things along the way. But I just I just feel compelled to say, please start and please be gentle with yourself that there's no time limit. You know, there's like no subscribed way. But if you met, if you start, then that's the that's the most powerful thing. And don't, wouldn't you agree, Claire, that once you actually do get that vision or you say to yourself, I'm going to do this, yes, it's hard, Don't, but it's not as hard as you think it's going to be or it can be as hard as you make it, basically. Okay. If you go, I'm going to do this, then the resources are all there. We've all got it within us to be able to do it. There's the help out there. But again, people go, oh, you know, it's going to take me 10 years to heal. No, it doesn't have to be that way. That's And no. that's the hope that we want to give our listeners it's not going to happen overnight, don't get us wrong, you know, we're not going to promise you that, but it doesn't have to be 10 years down the line, you can feel much better within a week, and then that just grows and grows and grows, and we flourish, and we, we bloom. And from that vision, and this is how I got into the coaching I do now, like, from that vision, you find your soul goal, you find the thing that you really, that person that you really are, you know, that true purpose, that true passion, and you start to see for yourself how you start operating your life from joy, a place of joy, a place of purpose. It's like your action suddenly becomes inspired and you see what you have to fix and what you have to heal and who you can go to. And it's like I think the universe steps in as well and provides some open doors because that vision becomes so clear and that intention becomes so strong that you are leaving that person behind. You are leaving that broken person behind. Yeah. Not to say, like I say, that there isn't a bunch of wisdom in that story. And if you get to that place where you want to help other people, then healing, like, it's 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 a must. You have to do that healing to be able to take that wisdom and to be able to share with others where you've come from and where how you've got to where you are, you know? I'm just going to leave our listeners with those three tools that you talked about feel the fire of intention be forgiving of yourself and create the vision of who you want to become and that's the walking testimony that you leave with our listeners today we know so many are going to be inspired by all that you've had to say and if they want to make contact with you they can find you on your website which is cw full circle is that right it is. Also, my Instagram is a great place to be, at CW underscore full underscore circle. And there's actually a link in the bio to what I call the Soul Goal Kit. 
I guess it's a summary of the journey that I did take, but it's free resources all the way through, starting with that vision and starting with those tools that you can use every day to start changing how you think and how you process, I guess, what you've been through. Perfect. We'll put all of those in the show notes. Thank you so much, Claire, for your time. And I'm sure there's many, many nuggets of information there for our listeners. So thank you so much for being courageous and brave and telling your story. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks so much for being with us today. For us to inspire others to live their magnificently imperfect life, please subscribe and leave us a five-star review on iTunes or on your podcast app. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Pods with Posh and Paul. We can't wait for you to join us on our next episode. Love, light and peace.